Previously on Wine and Winds. We talked about what makes sea otters so vital to the health and stability of their ecosystem. Without them, the kelp forests of the North Pacific simply would not exist. But even though conservation efforts have helped sea otters rebound from the fur trade, they remain an endangered species. So today, we're going to take a deeper dive into their watery world to find out why and to learn what we can do to help. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and head on down to the descriptions for ways that you can help support the channel. By the early 20th century, large-scale commercial hunting drove sea otters to the brink of extinction. And while an international ban on hunting was put into place in 1911, by that time their population had dwindled from hundreds of thousands of individuals down to less than a thousand. That's when modern conservation efforts began and the populations began to recover. Relocation efforts in the 1960s were also widely successful at restoring sea otters to about two thirds of their historic range. Most of these populations are thriving in what is widely considered the greatest success in marine conservation history. However, sea otter populations have recently declined in two important locations on their range. While the causes are unknown, there are a few theories. Some believe predation from orcas or sharks is to blame. But the evidence for this is mostly circumstantial and far from proven. In order to understand the threats that sea otters face, we must first understand what makes sea otters so unique in the first place. While other mammals, like whales, walruses, sea lions, and seals have thick layers of blubber to keep them warm in the frigid North Pacific. Sea otters have less than 2% body fat. They rely almost solely on a fur coat. Sea otters have the densest fur coat in the animal kingdom. twice as dense as the Golden Retrievers. They have around a million hairs per square inch. That's more hair on one square inch of a sea otter than there is on my entire head. The fur consists of waterproof guard hairs that are so dense that the layer of shorter under fur stays completely dry. For even more protection against the cold waters, sea otters can actually put their noses in their fur and exhale air that gets trapped in their dense fur coat, providing an extra layer of insulation. That's why they often leave a trail of bubbles in their wig when you're watching them from underwater. However, in order for the guard hairs to remain waterproof, they have to be exceptionally clean. That's why sea otters will spend a quarter of their lives grooming that fur coat. This thick fur coat and lack of body fat makes them a poor source of nutrition for sharks or killer whales who prefer animals with thick layers of blubber like seals and other whales. But it does make them particularly vulnerable to things like oil spills. A sea otter's fur loses its ability to repel water and retain air when exposed to oil. Unable to keep warm, the sea otter can quickly succumb to hypothermia. However, trying to clean its fur could make things worse for the animal. By licking that fur coat, they end up ingesting oil which can critically damage things like the liver, the kidneys, and even the lungs. In 1989, the Exxon Valdez oil spill decimated Alaska's sea otter population. Even though rescue efforts managed to save approximately 200 to possibly 350 individual animals, over 1,000 oiled otter carcasses were recovered. 
and the actual number of otter deaths is believed to be several times higher. Additionally, many of these rescues were sea otter pups. Juvenile sea otters stay with their moms for about six months before they're weaned and off on their own. They learn how to forage for food and to groom their fur coats. Without that knowledge, these pups cannot survive in the wild. So many of these pups were deemed non-releasable and acquired their homes at zoos and aquariums, where they became excellent ambassadors for their species. Here in British Columbia, I am one of a handful of people who is trained to respond to oiled wildlife. It's something called the Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response, or HAZWOPER, as we call it. And sadly, the next large oil spill is not a matter of if, but when. In fact, the government of BC expects a major oil spill to happen once every seven years. Every year, 30 to 50 oil tankers enter the port of Vancouver alone. Each one carries hundreds of thousands of dead weight tons of oil. And while crude oil spills generate the most headlines, a surprising fact that I learned throughout my Hazwapper course is that vegetable oil is actually the more common of oil spills. And many of these spills don't happen in the ocean. Some happen on land or in rivers, where they seep into the water supply and are carried straight out to sea. And that is where you and I come in. Because there are a lot of things you and I can do in our everyday lives to reduce our dependency on oil and furthermore help sea otters. We can reduce before we reuse and before we recycle. Properly dispose of hazardous wastes. Shop locally, and most importantly, we can share our knowledge with others. Thanks to the public pressure on governments after the Exxon Valdez disaster, all oil tankers are now required to be double hulled. This one step dramatically reduced the number of spills. To learn more, head down to the descriptions below for links to more information on sea otter conservation. Be sure to like, subscribe, and head over to my Twitch channel where we host weekly marine biology Q&As. And I'll see you next time when we take a deeper dive on Wine and Wins. <laughs>